abide in you and abide in your word, Lord, and help us to overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of your testimony, by what you've done in our life, by what your word says, Lord, and help us, to not, help us not to love this world or ourselves, but to lose our life for you, Father. And this I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Well, the last two times I've been preaching, I've been talking about how when all hell comes against you, bring all heaven against it. And uh, where I ended is right before we started talking about how do we overcome? How do we come all of hell? The Bible says the heart is deeply wicked above all things. Who can know it? God knows our heart. I hear people say all the time, well, God knows my heart. But they use it as if it's some kind of excuse if God thinks their motives are pure. Well, if you're going wrong, your motives aren't pure. And sometimes when you think you're doing right, your motives are definitely not pure. That's why it says the sword of the Spirit, it cuts, it chops, it divides the soul asunder, and it is a revealer of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Because I don't know how many of us later on realized we were doing something we thought was right, but our intents were not for the right reason. You want to be obvious about it. You've seen men in the world, they go after ladies, they're kind, they're courteous, and you know their intents of their heart are not pure. You know they're not. And that's what happens in the, in the church. We see people, they, they might do some good stuff, but their intent, why do they do it? If they come into a church and they're really nice and friendly and all of a sudden they try to split the church, well, then we know that their heart wasn't pure. Their, their top, the thoughts and the intents of their heart weren't in line with the word of God. And that's why it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It says, give me your heart. I would put my word upon your heart. I would wash you with my spirit and my word because your heart is wicked. Deceivingly wicked above all else. Now we know the devil's wicked and he'll come against us. We know the world is wicked. The Bible says if the world itself is, the, you know, the heavens are so filthy that they would flee away from God because he's so holy. How much more man who drinks up iniquity like water? So you could say it this way. Jesus said, you are of your children the devil and the lust of your father you will do. So before Christ comes into our hearts, we are of our father the devil and the lust of our father we will do. Now the Bible says, him you yield yourself a servant to obey, him you are a slave to whom you obey, whether to light of righteousness unto life, or whether to sin unto death. It says, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, he has given us many exceedingly great and precious promises, whereby we may be partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruptions in the world through lust. So what are we called to be? We're called to be Christians. We're called to be Christ-like. We're supposed to love him. This Bible says that you may know him, Jesus Christ, and in him is eternal life. So what is knowing Christ? What is loving Christ? In marriage, there's a thing called knowing your wife, and that is talking about when they two become one, when they, become, they come together in physical, emotional, in every area, and they become one. And that is what we are called to with Christ. We are supposed to become one with him in his love, in his hope, in his joy, in his peace, in his grace, in his holiness, in, his, in the fear of the Father, in obedience to the Father, in the will of the Father, and in reaching others for the Father. We are supposed to become one with God. We are supposed to become our partakers of heaven, and heaven will live inside of us. You know, there's a song that says, heaven's in my heart today. Well, if heaven's in your heart, who is, who is heaven? Christ is heaven to us, okay? Without Christ, there is no heaven. There's no getting there, and there is no heaven. I mean, people think of heaven as just some kind of arrival point where they can spend vacation for eternity. No, that is a point of being one with the Father. It's being in the household with the Father. It's being one with his, the Son. It's being a marriage to the groom, a marriage to Jesus Christ. It is just not a place. It is a person. Heaven is Jesus Christ. So we are supposed to have Christ in our heart. We are supposed to live in Christ in this world. And then it says, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we appear with him in glory. Christ, and it says, if a man be in Christ, in Christ we are a new creature. Behold, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So if we are in Christ, if we are in heaven, then we can take all of Christ, all of hell, heaven against hell. But if we're not in Christ, then we're none of his. That's why Jesus says, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, you desired the world, the flesh and the devil, you who did your own thing. He says, I don't know you. He says, you weren't one with me. You didn't love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You, he says, you were loved the world and the pleasures of Egypt. The Bible says, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. He says, you adulterers and adulterers, know you not with friendship with the world is enmity against God. I don't know about you, but there is times, many times in my life, where I was looking at something and I said, I know that ain't right, but I'm going to partake of it anyway. 
And guess what? My heart and my mind were being set at enmity against the word of God, against Jesus Christ. That's why it says, taking the word of God, that's why it says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, the pulling down of those strongholds, through casting down all high things and imaginations of itself that exalt itself against the knowledge of God. And that's the word of God. That exalts so we can cast down all kinds of hard things, you know. This, you know, excusing sin, the Bible says, this is wrong, therefore I will not partake of it. Or the Bible says, I am healed by the blood stripes of Jesus, therefore this sickness has no place. Or I have a physical need, the Lord said, who provide all my needs according to his riches and glory, therefore this thing has no place. That's why the Bible says, if you bow the knee, the Bible says, all things shall bow the knee to Jesus Christ and claim his Lord. Everything in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. So if... Christ is your head, and you are bowed the knee, then everything in heaven is yours. That's why it says, we are seated in the heavenly places with Christ. All the blessings in him are yes or amen. According to his blessings, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So when we're in Christ, when we're bowed the knee, when we're submitted, then everything that's in heaven is ours. Everything. All righteousness, all peace, all joy, all grace. When we are submitted to Jesus Christ, everything is ours. And then it says, on the earth. That means any physical needs, anything that comes against you, Christ is more than enough. There, It's under his feet because he's our head, as it says in Ephesians. But it also says under the earth. That means it doesn't matter what demonic thing comes against you, you can overcome it by Jesus Christ. Okay? People can pump up all kinds of different things. They can pump up sin and say, well, God will forgive us. Well, God says, I came to set my people from their sin. They can pump up the physical thing. It says, seek not the things of this world, but God will provide your needs. They can glorify the devil. The Bible says he's, he's like a roaring lion seeking. He's like a roaring lion. The Bible says that they're going to look at the devil who tempted them. The world, the nations of the world, and they're like, that's what tempted us. That's what tried us. So everything under, is under our feet through Jesus Christ. So what are our eyes, our heart, our mind supposed to be on? They're not supposed to be on sin in the sense of wanting to do it. They're supposed to be looking to Christ to overcome it. They're supposed to be on Jesus Christ. What are we supposed to be seeking in this world? Nothing. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and to be just like him and to obey him, his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So don't even worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to clothe on. Because the Bible says, the Father knows you need these things. He says, this is what the world seeks after. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Are we supposed to be afraid of the devil? No. God, our Jesus, already overcome them. He's supposed to be under our feet. So what our heart and our mind is supposed to be stayed upon is Jesus and his word. When we meditate upon his word night and day, then we'll be able to do all that's written there. And the Bible says, Great peace of they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. It says, if, if your delight is in the law of the Lord, you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever you do shall prosper. What you live in and abide in, you will produce. If you live and abide in sin, you will produce sin. If you live and abide in doubt and unbelief, you will produce fear and worry. If you live in the pride and murmuring complaining, you will produce a miserable life. But if you live in God's grace, you will overcome sin. If you live in his word, you will have a sound mind and a sound heart. If you live in a thankful and rejoicing, remembering what God's done for you, you will live in joy and joy unspeakable and full of glory. But we've got to live in Christ, live in his word, and live in his nature and his character. We're supposed to live in heaven, and therefore we can kill the seed of sin, we can overcome all the works of the enemy, and we can, nothing by any means shall harm us. Revelations 12, 11 says, how do we overcome? And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. So they overcome by the blood of the lamb. And we know who the lamb is. That's Jesus Christ. They overcome by realizing the price that Christ paid upon the cross by remembering it and walking in it. Matthew 26, 26 through 29 says, And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and break it and gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. He says, my body, this is my body. And he says, and he took the cup and gave thanks. He gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, or the New Covenant, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth out of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. He says, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. You've got to remember the price I paid. You've got to partake of what I said. You've got to partake of my nature, my character. You've got to partake of the price that I paid upon the cross. And you've got to do it daily in remembrance. The reason it's said daily is because daily we are supposed to remember the price he paid saved us from our sins, saved us from the world, that we may overcome it. Daily we remember it so we will not faint and grow weary. Daily we remember it that we can say we are strangers and pilgrims, we are not of this world. So we are supposed to daily partake of the blood of Jesus Christ. John 6, 53-56 says, Jesus said unto them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, 
unless we accept you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. The church, they think, well, we partake of Christ. Well, you can't say, you can't go, uh, tell your child this. He'll come up to you and say, I'm hungry. Well, he says, you ate last week. But, Daddy, I'm starving. Well, you ate last week. You don't need any more food. But the church, we think we partook of Christ, therefore we don't need him anymore. We partook of church, we partook of his word, therefore we don't need him anymore. And the devil's laughing all the way to the funeral parlor. He says, I mean, the, nobody in the world's dumb enough to go without food when they have a choice to eat. I mean, they, yeah, they can set themselves aside to fast and they do this, but nobody's willingly dumb enough not to eat when they're hungry. As a matter of fact, most of us eat way more than we should. Well, we know that in that's common sense. You need to breathe, you need to eat, you need to drink. Well, spiritually, which is actually more real than the physical, Christ in his word is more important than your water and your meat and your drink. So we are supposed to be abiding him in such a situation where we are so stuffed with Christ that when the devil comes with a little, little cupcake that's, with that's got arsenic in it, we're like, <laughs> I'm stuffed, devil. I don't know about you, but I've partaken of your arsenic, and I want nothing to do with it. I've had good food. I'm stuffed. We're supposed to be so full of Jesus and his word that the devil has no place in us. And that's what Jesus was. He says, the devil, prince of this world coming, you can find nothing in me. He says, I've given Jesus, I've given the Father everything. He says, I am so full of him, I, he, he, abide in him he abides in me and I abide in him. He says, I live by his commandments, I live by his word, I love him because I keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. He says, I am full of the Father and I only do those things which are pleasing in the Father's eyes. And he says, the devil has no place in me. And we know we're not to that place, but we are called to that place. The Bible says, press towards the mark for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Yes, and if any way other minded you be, any other way you be minded, Christ shall reveal this unto you. We are called to be single-eyed, single-minded, dwelling in Jesus Christ and his word. Without that, we won't have life. Without that, we won't produce fruit. The areas of our life that aren't surrendered to Christ will produce death. Okay, that doesn't mean you won't go through a hard time. But how many times we can look back in our life and we say, we went through this because we did this. We got that speeding ticket because we took the metal to the ground a little bit too hard. Or we knew we shouldn't have gone there, but we went there, and this happened because of it. Or we knew we shouldn't have bought that vehicle because it was too expensive. We didn't need it. We didn't have enough money or that house or whatever, but we did it anyway. Or we knew we shouldn't have, you know, there's many different areas in our life. We knew we shouldn't have done something, but we did it anyway, and it brought forth death. And some of them aren't as obvious. Some of them, we, you know, we don't teach our kids correctly when they're growing up. And all of a sudden, they, you know, all of a sudden later on, they're involved in sin and they go out in the world. But, that, you know, that's why God's mercy is there. You repent and he will forgive you and he will, you know, he'll give you the grace to see that through and that he can still bring life out of death. But, see, we plant things. We plant hell in our heart and our mind. And God wants to cause us to stop planting death and plant life. Because what you plant will bring forth fruit. He says, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He says, If you eat me, drink me, he says, you'll have eternal life. But if you don't, you won't. You'll die. That's why the Bible says, You abide in the vine, but whosoever doesn't abide in the vine will shrivel up and die, and they'll be cast into the fire and burned. And we've all been burned by hell. We've all been burned by sin. And he says, For my flesh is meat indeed. He says, You need my flesh. You need me. He says, I am your food. He says, is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the God of God. We live by Jesus. We live by his word. And he says, my blood is drink indeed. He says, that he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth or liveth and abideth in me and I in him. If you don't eat his flesh, if you don't drink his blood, if you don't read his word, if you don't singly eye to fix upon Christ to where he's your life and your light, if you don't meditate upon his word night and day, if you aren't filled with the Spirit speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, then you won't have the grace of God to overcome. Because God provides, if you don't eat food, you become weak. If you don't partake of Christ, you don't have the strength to overcome hell. Hell will come against you. The Bible says when, you know, when the devil comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Well, the word and the blood and the nature and character of Jesus Christ, the testimony and his love and his life are the standard we raise up against the devil. If you notice, it talks about the armor of God. It says the shield of faith. Faith comes by hearing. The sword of the spirit. You know, it says the belt of truth, which is the word of God. Righteousness, which is a heart seeking him and giving him everything and obeying him. 
a helmet of salvation, a remembrance of the blood of the Lamb, that you have been bought with the blood, and that His blood is precious, that you don't mistreat it and use it as an excuse to commit sin, but as, a, as it truly is, something precious, that He bought us from our darkness, that we might be set free. So you said, the helmet, Christ saved me, He shed His blood, I will not partake of this, because the Lord bought me from this. He is worthy of all I am, and I am not going to partake of this. The breastplate of righteousness, He bought me, I, by His grace I can overcome. You know, all these things come from looking to Christ, looking from his word that we may overcome. And he says, he's okay. He says, you will live in me, but without me you have no life. So if you notice yourself in sin, if you notice yourself in the world, then you say, Lord, forgive me. And I'm going to come to a point of death. That's why the Bible says you must die. Jesus said, if a kernel of wheat falls into the ground, it'll die, but it'll produce fruit. We have to die to the world. We have to die to the flesh. We have to die to our emotions. If, you, if the flesh is still kicking, then it's time to take, by the grace of God and the word of God, to kill it. Because if, if the flesh is looking at modern stuff, they believe in all these, you know, they always making stuff about nasty stuff, you know, zombies and all this junk. Well, the flesh is more wicked and vile than any zombie. Because it commits sin. It does these wicked things. The, the unredeemed heart and mind, when you're not yielded to God, the human heart will create all kinds of wickedness and vileness. If you have this stuff, and this thing happens in your life, say, Lord, forgive me, this thing needs to die. That's why the Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because if you're filled with Him, then you won't have any love for anything else, and you won't have room for it. Because the heart and the mind, they are born in sin. The flesh, this body, is born in sin. And you know what it wants? It wants sin. It wants that which is wrong. The Bible, that's why Jesus, Paul says, I beat myself black and blue, lest I myself become a castaway. We have taught in the modern day gospel that it's like some kind of sit back and drink lemonade. No, the devil is like a roaring lion. He's out to devour you. If you're in a war zone and the world's out and the, the enemy's trying to kill you, you don't sit back and take it easy. You're deadly serious about this thing. You know that if you don't pay attention, if you don't keep attention on, the, on your officers, if you don't follow their commands, if you don't keep your weapons clean, if you don't keep your armor clean, if you don't make sure you have a ready supply of food, that you will die and you won't make it. And that is this life. It says this life is like a vapor that is here and is gone. The trials of this world are not to be compared with your glory shall reveal in us. We know that this world is going to be a trial. We know it's going to be a test. But we are supposed to look to Christ and be full of him to where we can overcome it. Now, like I said, if you find stuff in your life that isn't right, what do you do? You repent, you look to Christ to overcome it. But we are trying. That's why Paul says, I forget those things were behind, and I press towards the mark for the prize, the high calling. He says, the high calling is Jesus Christ. He says, the high calling is to be just like him. He says, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. He says, I, yes, I'm resurrected with him, but I'm also dead with him, because if I'm dead with him, I'll also live with him. We've got to be dead to the world, dead to the flesh, dead to the sin, to where we can be alive to Jesus Christ. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He says, Have the same heart, have the same mind, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He says, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It says, Christ. Have the same heart, this mind that Jesus did that says, I'm going to obey the Father. I'm going to sacrifice my life because the Father told me to. But I'm going to give my life for the life of this world, for others might be saved and healed and delivered. And we are called to that same death. We are called to that same resurrection to be together with him eternity. We are called to lay down what we want, what we desire, that we may know his heart, his desires, his will, and that others may see Jesus Christ in us and be set free. All right? If you know, a rescue person, I, I said this one, I think my last sermon, a rescue person, they are taught to, the, a lot of, it's really rough life being involved in fire, you know, all these different survi rescuing of people, and it depends, like Coast Guard or, or, or um, you know, a fireman or some of the more, some of the other areas. It's not an easy job. You have to be trained. You have to be ready. You have to watch. You have to have all this equipment. You have to risk your life to save others. And Christians are called to be the same way. It's not easy. It's not fun sometimes. But we are called to rescue people. And that's who we are called. That's what, that is what the Great Commission is. We are called to be a partaker of the blood of Jesus Christ, a partaker of his cross, to be put on Jesus Christ, to live through Jesus Christ, to have his word, and to go forth and delight ourselves in the same thing he delighted in. He says, 
Ephesians 1, 1, 7 says, In whom we have redemption, even through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. He says, we have been bought with his blood. He says, we've been forgiven. He says, he's given us his grace. 1 John 4, 9 through 10 says, And this was revealed the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son in the world that we might live through him. He says, this is the love of God. This is the blood. This is the, 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 the ultimate conclusion of the love of God, that we might live through Jesus Christ. Now, Christ wasn't called, Christ overcame sin. He says, so we overcome the world and the flesh and the devil through Christ. He says, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the payment for our sins. He says, we are called to live as Jesus lived, to have the same heart, to have the same mind, to have heaven in our heart. First Peter 1 through 8 says, whom ye have not seen, ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, yet ye believe, and ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. He says, and whom ye not seen, ye love. He says, even though we don't see Christ, we know the price he paid. We know what he has done upon that cross, and we love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. He says, and whom you see him not, yet believe him. You trust, you hope, you rest in him. He says, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable. He is your joy. He is your delight. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Well, what is your desires of your heart? If they're for sin, then your delight is in Christ, because what you delight in, that's what you want. If you delight yourself in the lady before you marry her, then that's the one you want to marry. If you delight yourself in Christ, that's who you want to be like. That's who you want to spend your time with. That's one who you want to delight yourself in. That is who we are called to be. That is supposed to be the delight of our life. And he says, we are supposed to have joy and delight and trust and a love in Jesus Christ. What is your love? The Bible says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If all your time is consumed with the job, but not doing it as unto the Lord and not preaching the truth, then... You're, you're, then your treasures are in this world. If you're all your pla- all your time is in pleasures in the world and fiction and fantasy and the things of this world, that's where your heart is. If your delight is in fear and worry, anger and bitterness, things that aren't of God, then that's where your heart is. Our heart, our treasure is supposed to be in Jesus Christ. The parable, it says, a man comes across a, a treasure in a field of a pearl of great price. He hides it. He goes all he can and sells everything he has and gives it for that pearl of great price or for that treasure in the field. That's Jesus Christ. Now, I've heard it preached, and I've even preached it, where it's talking about souls. It can be. But it's truly talking about Jesus Christ, because he is the great treasure. He is the pearl of great price. He is what we give everything we have for. We are supposed to lose all that we have, give all that we are for Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, I've given you all things. He says, you know, the disciple says, Lord, we've given up everything. He says, well, in this life, you're going to have this, this, this. He says, you're going to have all these parents, these mothers, these kids, because wherever you go, you're going to have a brother and sister in Christ. Wherever you go, you're going to have a mom and father in Christ. Wherever you go, there's going to be people who will take you into their household, and that's what the church is. That's why they sold everything they had and gave it as people had need, because their heart and mind was in heaven. Their heart and their life was in Jesus Christ. And if we look at the modern-day church, we're like, well, they're definitely not in the place of Acts. We look at the church of Acts as, wow, that's awesome. Okay, well, I guess it's, you know. We treat it as if it's something unnormal or special. No, that's what Christianity is supposed to be where we love God so much that nothing in this world matters, where you can take the shirt off our back and we'll give you our coat also, where you slap us on the one cheek and we'll give you the other one also, where you ask us to go one mile, we'll go with you two miles, where you know where you'll forgive your brother, where you'll leave all you are and follow Christ, where you, like Jesus said to the rich man, you'll strip yourself and make sure those in need have it and you'll come and follow Jesus Christ. These are all part of what Jesus preached and they're all supposed to be in our life. And if we're not in our life, then we know we have not arrived. And Paul says, I know I haven't apprehended. So I'm going to see Christ with all I am that I may apprehend that for which I'm apprehended. But in the modern day church, we actually preach the opposite, that you don't have to apprehend that for which you've been born for. You don't have to apprehend that for which Jesus Christ has called you for. That is our life. That is our vision. That is our truth. That is what we live for, is to be just like Jesus Christ. If you, how can you call yourself what, if you say, well, I know that person, but you never talk to him, you don't know anything about him, well, then you really don't know him. I mean, Dad told us that story about a guy who one time came and he filled in some potholes in our parking lot. And a couple years later, he was Dad's best friend and an elder here. Dad says he only attended church like two to three times. He didn't know Dad. He wasn't his best friend. He wasn't his elder. But people go around and say, I know Christ. I love Christ. Well, you, do you love him enough to go to church? Do you love him enough to pray to read the word of God? Do you love him enough to tell other people about him? Do you love him enough to give up those things which are wrong? 
Do you love him enough to be your heart and your mind consumed with him? Do you love him enough to live and die for him? If you don't, then he isn't the love of your life. The Bible says, he says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. And he says, if you keep my commandments, then you love me. He says, but if you don't keep my commandments, then you don't love me. See, the word of God is, for, is, you know, the Bible says, when it says about exalt yourself against the knowledge of God. In other words, anything that's contrary to the word of God, you say, well, your word says this, therefore I believe it, therefore by your grace I can do it. That's faith. Anything else is doubt and unbelief. And the Bible says anything that's not of that faith is sin. So if you, if it's anything. It, it can be you can be over it can be illness it can be over thing now there's a sin not on the death in the sense of if you can go to he- heaven dying by illness but you can't go to heaven with unforgiveness in your heart the bible says you don't forgive your your brother you can see he says i won't forgive you he so there's things in our life the bible says it lays it out and it says these things in your life you will not be a partaker of heaven and so we've got to partake of jesus christ we've got to have his nature and his character to where we can overcome he says Hebrews 10, 29, 39 says, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who is trodden under foot of the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. He says, back in the Old Testament, when they did something wrong, and under two witnesses, they were condemned. He says, and, and their punishment was great. But he says, how much more punishment shall they be thought worthy, who have trodden under foot the Son of God? Who have said, Lord, I'm going to lay you as a face mat. I'm going to a face mat. I'm going to, uh, you know, place the put my feet, clean my dirty feet off of, and re- disregard. I'm going to use you to fill in my potholes. You know, I need some money, so Lord, here you are. You'll provide my. In other words, they treat Jesus Christ instead of being the love of their life and whom they long for and desire. They treat him as an appliance. They treat him as a microwave, or they treat him as a special tool or a special kind that they only pull out at a certain time of the year or only on certain days. And we, I believe we've all been guilty at that time to where Jesus wasn't the center of our life, but he was an appendage. He was an appliance. He was a piece of jewelry that we put on when we go to church. But he wasn't our life. He wasn't our true heart desire. And Christ is calling us to be one with him. He's calling us to be one with each other, one with the Father, and one with all Jesus is. He's calling us to heaven. He's calling us to have heaven in our hearts. And he says, where we he was sanctified or purified and set apart an unholy thing. He says, For we know him that said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will re- recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days, in which after you were eliminated, you, illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. He says, When Christ saved you, and all of a sudden things came against you, but you were looking to Christ, you were overcoming. He says, For ye had compassion on me and my bonds, and took joyfully the swelling of your goods, knowing that in yourself you have in heaven a better and a during substance. He says, You had compassion. He was talking about, you know, he was talking about this church, and they were saying how you took joy about how I was in bonds just to try to tell you the truth, and how you didn't care about your, your finance, you didn't care about the things of this world. And he says, that you knew that in heaven was a more valuable thing. You knew that you've been bought with the precious blood of the Christ. You knew that you were headed for heaven. You knew that Jesus Christ is worthy of all that you had, all that you are, and all that you ever will be, and that the things of this world had no meaning. He says, you knew these things. He says, I'm warning you, though. These things are precious. These things are true. Don't give them up. Don't lay. Don't love the things of this world. Don't go back to Egypt. Don't go back to the world. He says, cast not away, therefore, your confidence. This is surety that Christ bought you with his blood, and he is worthy of you all. That the things of this world have no meaning, and that he is supposed to be your life. He says, don't cast away this confidence. He says, which has great recompense and reward. That's why he says, the things of this world are not going to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It hasn't even entered in the heart and the mind of the things which God has prepared for them who love him. He says, now the just shall live by faith. He says, now, you ain't going to feel like it all the time, but he says, you live by faith. Faith that says, Lord, you are worthy, therefore, anything that's wrong is not worthy of you, therefore, I repent and give it to you. Lord, you are worthy of all my end. Who cares about the things of this world? They can burn, they can perish for all I care. All that's important is that I serve you and love you and obey you, and that I reach for others to rescue them. He says, we know that our treasure is in heaven, not the things of this world. He says, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. He says, but if any man decide that it's not worth the price and go back, he says, he's not worthy of me. But he says, 
but we are not them who draw back unto perdition. Now we see in the in, in the uh, you know the prodigal son, he drew back. The Bible says he was dead to me. He was lost. Okay, I don't know how many of, at times we've been dead. We've been lost to the Father because we were more worried about spending what Christ gave to us in our own worldly desires and fleshly and carnal ways. But he says, all of a sudden he woke up and said, "Whoa, what am I doing in the pigsty?" He says, man, the worst amongst my father have more love, more joy, more kindness, more peace, more grace. Man, I can remember when I was there. I mean, man, it was great. It was awesome. I had joy. I had peace. I had victory. You know, I didn't even want the things. Why in the world did I come back to this place? Why in the world did I come back to the sin? Why in the world did I let the devil blind me and chain me again? He says, I don't know. He says, I'm fed up. I'm going back to the father. He says, I'm going back to Jesus. He says, I'm getting out of this pigsty. I'm getting away from the world. He says, I've bought all the world. He says, I've had all the sin I can hack. I've had all the flesh I can hack. I've had all the world I can hack. And he says, I want nothing to do with it. And some of us just, we need to come to that point and we say, I want nothing to do with it. I want nothing to do with hell. I want nothing to do with sin. I want nothing to do with doubt. I want nothing to do with bitterness. I want nothing to do with fear. I want nothing to do with despair. I want nothing to do with the pleasures of this world. I want nothing to do with fantasy and carnality and things that aren't right. I want nothing to do with it. I want Jesus. I want heaven. And he says, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul, them that believe to the point of fleeing from the wrath to come, those that believe that Christ is worthy, those who love him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, them who come to a realization that this world is on sinking sand and it's going to sink. We look around the world. We look at what's going on. And everything is sinking. I read articles about tech and all of a sudden I read the comments down below. And I'm like, man, this world is in trouble. The stuff be coming out of people's mouths. The stuff they believe. The things going on. I'm like, man, it makes you want to despair. That's why it says, you know, you're supposed to be on Christ and not of things of this world because you will despair. But if, when you see it, you're like, you know the world's in trouble. You know we're all headed down a slippery path. You know things are going to get worse. The things of this world are gone. They're going to burn up. They have no meaning. It says, that's why it says, you think you're rich, you're fool, you have need of nothing, but no, not you're blind, destitute, and naked, and poor. He says, come to me and have your eyes anointed. You know, have tr- gold, gold tried in the fire. Have the robes of righteousness. Have faith that endures, that overcomes, and that's more precious than silver and gold that perisheth. He says, you know, have your eyes that you may have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that understands. You know, sometimes when it talks about the, uh, the, you know, it says, you know, they have eyes to see, but they see not ears to hear, that hear not in heart that under, doesn't understand. I say, Lord, they had an eye that didn't see. They had an ear that didn't hear. They didn't, have, they didn't have a heart to understand. I pray, Lord, let me have eyes to see. Let me have ears to hear. And let me have a heart to understand. All the word of God is given for reproof, rebuke, and for exhortation. So even a reproof can be an exhortation. Even an exhortation can be a warning. The Bible, you know, so when the Bible says something and warns us, we can say, Lord, I repent, but now I take this to heart and I use it by your grace to make sure I do that which is right. All the word of God is given for everything we need that pertains in the life and godliness. Hebrews 12, 1 through 6 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. He says, seeing we have all the examples in the Old Testament of what to do and what not to do. What to do in the apostles and what not to do. I mean, we don't want to call fire down upon people's heads or, you know, like the sons, the sons of thunder did. We don't want to go out and do what the, uh, David did and he stopped warring the good fight of faith and he got up on a high place. He got exalted in himself. He took his eyes off of Christ. Then he looked upon something he shouldn't, and then all of a sudden he did something, and then he murdered him. We don't want to do these things, but we do want to do what they did do. We want to be so full of the word of God that it says, I, I meditate upon his word night and day, I'm do all this written there. And he says, you know, I killed the lion, I killed the bear, I killed Goliath. We want to take a hold of the good things in the word of God, and we want to take heed of those things which are wrong. He says, we are surrounded with such a great cloud of witnesses. You know, the Bible says those who don't learn, no, the Bible doesn't say it, they have a saying. It says, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. We'll say it this way. Those who don't learn from the word of God are doomed to repeat the failures in the Bible. If we don't have the word of God in our heart and our mind when it comes to the good things and the warnings in every area, we are doomed to repeat or not partake of that. Okay, if you don't know about God will heal you, then you won't be healed. Unless God makes a miracle and somebody, let you know, and, you know, somebody prays for you and you're healed. But if you don't know about the fruit of the you know, Holy Spirit, you won't have the Holy Spirit. But it's also in the other things. If you don't know that you're supposed to have victory over things, if you don't know these things are wrong, then they'll destroy you. 
We are supposed to know the word of God to where we can know the warnings to where we won't fall and stumble. That's why it says the fear of the Lord. You need the fear of the Lord because you've got to know who God is. You've got to know his holiness and his righteous. Therefore, you know that you are in danger when you are partaking of certain things. But you've got to know his promises. Therefore, you won't stumble and fall in despair. The Bible says, you know, you have not yet resisted on the blood. He says, don't be worried and faint because you have not yet resisted on the blood striving against sin. He says, he says, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, he says, let us say aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us. He says, there's a weight on you. He says, there's a sin that will easily beset you. He says, lay aside the weight. In other words, stop worrying. Stop getting fearful. Stop getting doubtful about the things of this world. Stop worrying about the things of this world. But look to me. He says, cast aside those sins which so easily beset us. Say, Lord, this ain't right. I'm getting rid of it by your blood and your grace. He says, I'm not going to partake of these things. I am going to be deadly serious. I'm going to press towards the mark. And he says, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. He said, let us run with the faith that endures the race that is set before us. Going what? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That is what it says next. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised and the shame, to set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He says, remember the blood as the beginning point and press toward Jesus Christ. He bought you with your blood, therefore look to him to overcome. And he says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. He says, You have not yet resisted on the blood, striving against sin. He says, Don't be wearied. Don't be, don't, if you fail, if you don't stumble, confess your sins. He is faithful and just, but look to Christ to overcome it. Because he says, You know, he, he, he went through so much. I mean, he knew the hearts of all men. Now, I don't know about you, but if there's times people could see into my heart, man, I'd be dead and embarrassed. There's times if I, I found out what people were involved in later, and I'm like, oh, 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 it grieves you. If I could see into each one of your hearts, you guys wouldn't want to be sitting here. You'd want to be somewhere else. If you could see into my heart, you might want, you know what I'm saying? We don't want to be that. We don't want to have that ability. But Jesus did. Jesus could see into our hearts, into our minds. He knew all many. That's why he says he didn't join himself to no one. He knew what was in the hearts of his disciples. I mean, they were scheming how they could be his right-hand man. They were scheming about how everybody else was going to be on their feet, and they were going, ha, 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 look how special I am, and ha, ha, ha. If you don't obey me, I'm going to kill you. I mean, he knew what was in the heart of his disciples. He knew what was in the heart of people, and he says, I have come that I might set you free from that wicked, vile nature which comes from the devil. He says, I have come that I might set you free. I have come that I might give you my word and my spirit that people will look upon you and say, these people were dumb. These people didn't know what they were doing. They used to be wicked people. But he says, now they've been with Jesus Christ. And that's what they did. They looked at the apostles and said, man, these people, they've been with Jesus. They're completely different people. He says, Ye have not yet resisted on the blood, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not thou the chasing of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If you're whipped, good. You feel horrible when you sin, good. If you have nightmares when you've done something wrong, good. Because then you're a son of God. Because then he's reaching out to give you victory. Because then he cares enough about you to try to deliver you, to try to free you. Don't let the devil condemn you if you messed up. But say, Lord, you bought me with your blood. Your blood is precious. Therefore, it bought me. It bought me enough to get me victory over it. It bought me enough that I'm going to fight the good fight, and I'm going to give you this area of my life. And it bought me enough that I'm going to bring honor and glory to your name by overcoming it. That is the blood of Christ. That is the overcoming by the blood lamb because he shed his blood to set you free. Don't let the devil, don't let the world, don't let the flesh, don't let him anything tell you otherwise. Jesus bought you with his blood, and that is enough to give you victory over every worry, over every fear, over every doubt, over every sin, over every past thing, and over everything you might be struggling now. It is enough to give you victory. But that's why it says the just shall live by faith. Give a hold of the grace and the faith by Jesus Christ that you may overcome. We are given these promises. We are given the word that we might take them as a sword to the devil in the flesh. And it says... He says, my son, don't, don't, don't get upset when you're rebuked. He says, the Lord loves you. He wants to set you free. So take a hold of the grace. Take a hold of the word. Take a hold of the promises. Say, Lord, I am sorry. I'm going to take a hold of your blood. I'm going to take a hold of your grace. I'm going to overcome. I'm going to saturate myself so much in the word of God that I feel like a pickle, I'm like a pickle thing to where I have a different scent, a different smell, a different taste because I've been pickled in you. You will be pickled in something. You will be burning with something. You will be consumed with something. 
be pickled, be consumed, be burning with Jesus Christ and with his word. If, the, if, you're not, if you got the smell of hell, then you don't have enough heaven in you yet. If you got something wrong, you don't have enough of Jesus Christ in you now. So don't tell the devil, let the devil say, well, I can't read the word, I can't meditate, I can't pray, I can't love God, I can't live for God because I got this in my life. Well, they say, Lord, this is wrong, therefore I don't have enough of you, I'm going to get more of you in me. You know, you don't go to the doctor and say, I've got cancer, therefore I can't get treated. You know, you say, oh man, I'm a mess. I've got this illness, I've got this disease, now I'm coming to you and I need to be cured. Come to Jesus Christ. Our eyes are supposed to be on him, our heart's supposed to be on him, our mind's supposed to be on him, our life's supposed to be on him. So don't listen to the devil say, when you can't overcome, because you can't look to Christ to overcome this. Well, that's why Jesus came, to help you overcome. Don't look to, you know, don't, don't look to the world to overcome. He says, our confidence is in Jesus Christ. Don't rely on yourself. That's why Jesus rained down man upon the Hebrew children's heads night and day. That's why it was water out of the rock. That's why there was the fire by day and the cloud by night. He says, I've given you the fire of the Spirit. I've given you the cloud of the Spirit to lead you. He says, I've given you the manna, which is Jesus, which is the Word. He says, I've given you the water, which is the, you know, Jesus Christ, the water, the King of the water, the Spirit of God. All these things were examples and testimonies. And he says, you need these things. You need the fire burning in your heart, that passion for Jesus. He says, you need the presence of God. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourself in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. He says, it is written, man should not live by bread alone. You need to meditate on his word nine days. You may be able to do all that's written there. It says he might, they loved us and gave himself for us. He might sanctify and cleanse us with the washing of water by the word. You need the water out of the rock. You need to be reminded of the price Jesus paid. You need to be reminded of the word. You need to be reminded of the fire and the passion you once had. It says, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbors itself. He says, you used to love me, but you've gone away from your first love. We're supposed to have all these things in our life. These are all testimonies of how we overcome. We need these things. We need heaven in our heart, or else we will have something else. Hebrews 13, 12 through 16 says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. He says, Christ suffered that he might sanctify you. Now what is sanctification? Pulling you out of the world, cleansing you, purifying you, refining you, because you're a mess without Christ. And then putting his name in. This piece of work was made by God. This piece of work belongs to God. And it brings honor and glory to God. And that's what we're called to. And he, that's why he shed his blood. And that's why we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. And he says, Let us go forth therefore on them without the camp bearing his reproach. Let us come forth out of the world bearing the price he paid, saying, The world crucified Christ, therefore I only glory in him. I am crucified in the world, and the world is crucified unto me. I am dead, but nevertheless I live. It's not I live, it's Christ that liveth in me. In the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Therefore I will love him and give myself to him. And he says, For we have no, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. He says, We know the things of this world are going to pass away, they're worthless. He says, but we seek an eternal city. We seek a, 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 a city built with heaven, not built with man's hands. He says, we know we are strangers, we're pilgrims, we're not of this world. He says, by them, therefore, by Jesus Christ, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continuously. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Praise, it says, bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continuously be in my mouth. It says, in everything give thanks. Rejoice in the Lord at all times. Be thankful, be rejoicing, be praising unto him. And you know, a thankful heart, a rejoicing heart, you can see it in each part of the scripture verse I read at the beginning of this. It says, overcome by the blood of the Lamb, thankful for what he's done. The word of our testimony, remembering what he's done, remembering what the word promises, and loving not your life unto death. In other words, loving Christ more than you love this world. So we can see a thankful heart, a rejoicing heart, a praising heart in the middle of all this. In the middle of that is all a thankfulness, a gratefulness, a praise, a love, an honoring and a glorifying and a rejoicing in Jesus Christ. He says, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. He says, but to do that which is right, don't forget. The Bible, you know, the devil will try to get you wrapped up and trying to f just f struggle against your own flesh, try to get, make you wrapped up in yourself to where you're not reaching forth and not doing what God has called us to do, which is preach the truth, feed the poor, clothe the naked, to do those things which God has called us to do. He said, the devil will try to wrap you up. He says, don't forget these things. Don't become clouded. Don't become confused. Don't get wrapped up in yourself. Be wrapped up in Jesus Christ and working together with him. And he says, to communicate, tell other people about him. But he says, for what such sacrifices, God is well pleased. He says, this is the sacrifice that God's well pleased with, that you come out of the world, you bear his cross, that you love him, that you don't want the things of this world, that you are, have a thankful, a grateful heart, and following and glorifying God, and that you do that which is right, and you give and you reach out to others. 
He says, this is a sacrifice God is well pleased with. Mark 8, 34, 38 says, And when he had called the people on them, when disciples said unto them, Whosoever cometh to me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He said, Whosoever cometh to me, let him remember the price I paid upon the cross, make that cross his cross. He says, let him pick up his cross. His cross. We need to make the cross of Jesus our cross. We need to say, your blood was shed, it's my blood. Your blood was shed, and it's precious to me. I make it, I make it the center. I make it my reason. He says, I make it my rhyme. He says, make the price I paid, the price you paid. Make the love I showed you, the love that you showed me in return. He says, make it the center. He says, pick up your cross, make the price Christ paid, and make it as if, if, if your own son had to bear it. That's why it says, you know, and um, it says the Hebrew children will look upon him whom they pierce and will weep for him as if it was their own child. We need to take a hold of what Jesus did as if it was us who had to do it, or somebody precious to us had to do it. We need to make Jesus precious in our heart and our mind. We need to sanctify Jesus in our heart. Sanctify him in our mind and sanctify him in our actions. Sanctify him in our heart. It says, guard your heart, let something out, because out of it come the issues of life. We need to make Jesus our issue of our heart. We need to make him our center to where something else won't creep him in. We need to make him our thought and our meditation. Therefore, you know, something else won't creep in. We need to make him what we speak about. You know, in Deuteronomy 6, it talks about how you need to speak about him when you get up in the morning, when you go, when you're walking in the way, when you lie down, you need to make him the scent. It says, make the commandment about loving the Lord your God with everything, what you teach your kids, what you speak about, what you rest upon, what you talk about, what you get excited about, make it in front of your eyes, make it around, the, around your hands, say, I only do those things which are pleasing the Father's hands. He says, make it the post of your house. In other words, every area of your life is founded upon the Word of God and Jesus Christ. He says, um, you know, guard your gate. He says, put them upon your gates. In other words, your eye gates. I will put nothing wicked in front of my eyes. I will only listen to those things which are faithful and true. He says, I will only think of pure, honest, of good report, there be any virtue to do any praise, think on these things. I will put Jesus and his word and his blood in the center and in every area of my life, and I will not let other things in there. And we think sometimes, or it's fine, I can do this, I can do this. I don't know, I mean, oh, I can check news, I can, you know, I can go watch this movie, I can read this fiction book. What happens after you get done with that stuff? You feel like crap. It opens the door to the devil. I mean, it, it, it's not worth it. I mean, we've all been to the point where we're sitting there and we just had a good meal and then somebody brings out this dessert and we're like, oh, man, if I partake of that, not only am I going to be sick, I'm going to put on the pound. We know it's not worth it, but we partake of it anyway. And that is, we're back to the, it's, it's the cupcake with arsenic. That's what sin is. That's what the world is. That's what the things of this world are. They seem treasurable, pleasurable for a season, but the end of there is death. And he says, he says, take up his cross and follow me. In other words, not take up what Jesus did and continue to follow him. It's not a, I, I give Jesus my heart, now I'm going to do what I want. It's not, he set me free, therefore I, uh, now I don't have to trust in him. And he says, you've got to abide in me or else you won't be able to produce fruit. He says, if you don't abide in me, my words don't abide in you. He says, you'll have no life. You won't be able to produce anything. He says, you're a branch. And he says, if the branch is disconnected from the vine, it ain't going to produce any fruit. People don't go, ha ha, stupid branch, ah, you can't grow anything. They're like, no, that branch needs to be connected back into the tree. That's why we don't mock people. That's why we don't criticize them. That's why we preach the truth in love. Because we see them disconnected from Jesus Christ and we say, man, they're shriveling up and dying here. They're being burned from the fires of hell. We got to give, tell them the truth. We got to get them back, grafted back into the mind. And he says, for whosoever save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel, the same shall save it. He says, if you give your life for me and to reach others, he says, you'll find your life. He says, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? He says, well, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? He says, the things of this world have nothing. They're worth nothing. He says, what are you going to, I mean, look at Esau. He was hungry. He had a deer on his back. He had everything he needed to provide for his meal, but he had to spend an extra few minutes preparing it. But he sold his whole inheritance for a bowl of porridge. And how many times has God given us the truth, God's given us victory, and all of a sudden the devil brings a stupid temptation on us, and we know better, but we go partake of it anyway, because, oh, man, I used to remember when I sit back and watch that movie, did this, oh, it's so comfortable, so relaxing, blah, blah. And we sell what Christ just gave us for a stupid bowl of porridge. Now, I bet you it didn't taste very good either. But it doesn't matter. He sold everything for a stupid bowl of food. He had everything God, God had provided him, given him a deer or whatever. I mean, he had everything he needed. I mean, he was known as a great hunter. God had given him everything he needed. He had the inheritance, he had everything. But he sold it all for a bowl of porridge. I mean, you're going to sell, you're going to sell, you're going to give your house away for a piece of pizza? That's, that's what it is. We give what Christ gives us for a stupid slice of a Twinkie. 
a stupid slice of a movie, a stupid slice of a game, a stupid slice of a fiction book, a stupid slice of anger or bitterness, a super slice of looking at something we shouldn't look at. We sell ourselves for a bowl of porridge. Why? Well, that's why we got to be saturated with Jesus. That's why we got to be filled with Christ. Otherwise, we'll think we're hungry. Therefore, we'll try to fill ourselves with something. But if we're not filled with Jesus, we're not filled with his word, then the devil can make everything look nice. Everything looks precious. I mean, I don't know. I mean, has there ever been something you knew was worthless, but because you were so desperate, you know, you bought it anyway, you know, that product breaks down, but I need it so bad, I'll buy it anyway. I know it'll break down, but I'll buy it anyway, or something where you knew better. Looks so good. <laughs> we've all bought things we know we shouldn't. But that's why we've got to have Christ, because then we'll know he's the answer. We'll know it's victory. Then we've got to have the word, because we know he's the victory. Otherwise, the devil can take any old hill of beans, any old bowl of porridge, any old breaking down piece of junk, and make it seem valuable to us. And he says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and simple generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed. He says, take a hold of the word, take a hold of the blood, take a hold of the cross, treat it precious, be pr boast, my, you know, it says in Psalm 34, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. Boast on Jesus, boast on his word, boast on what he's done. And he says, when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels, we're supposed to love, eat, enjoy, rejoice, delight, abide, abide be consumed with Jesus and his word. Then we will be filled with the joy. Then we'll be filled with the peace. Then we'll be filled with the grace and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Then we will be um, trees planted by the rivers of water that bring us forth its fruit in a season. We will not wither, and what we do shall prosper. But that's why we've got to abide in Christ. That's why we forsake not the assembly of ourselves together. That's why we meditate upon his word night and day. That's why we sing to ourselves psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in the hearts of the Lord. That's why we have to keep the word and Jesus in front of our eyes and hide it in the midst of our heart. Otherwise, we'll die. If you want some prayer, come on up. We all need it. <laughs> Jesus said, I've given you everything I am. 